tonight I'm going to do something a little bit different. So I shoot many different types of nebulas, but the one I'm going to do tonight is a little bit different with regards to what kind it is. This particular nebula is more commonly known as the Western Veil Nebula. And essentially what it is is a star that exploded. Stick with us and you're gonna see all about this. Once again, I am going to be using the Explorer Scientific 127 millimeter FCD 100 carbon fiber telescope. Where I feel like this telescope really does well is holding focus. The fact that it's carbon fiber means it's less likely to expand and contract with temperature variations. And with that, the lens inside don't really change all that much in the course of the night. So I don't really have to spend much time doing my refocuses every so often. Uh, with my Newtonian after a meridian flip, there's no way that I could keep imaging without doing a, another focus because that mirror does shift ever so slightly. So as I had said, tonight we're gonna be doing a different nebula. Over here to my east is where it's gonna rise and it's gonna come all the way up overhead, almost entirely up to zenith. And this particular nebula is about 1500 light years away. Some estimations put it closer to about 1,470 light years, but let's be honest, what's, what's 30 additional light years at that point? It has a magnitude of seven, which means even a one-shot color camera can pick up wonderful detail of this nebula without needing the help of narrowband filters. Now, for the sake of this particular imaging run, we're gonna use narrowband and broadband filters. So we're gonna use red, blue, and green filters with my monochrome camera, as well as sulfur, hydrogen, and oxygen. And the reason why I'm gonna do that is it's going to allow me to create multiple different variations of this image. These different variations can be a hydrogen, oxygen, oxygen color palette, or even the traditional Hubble palette, which is sulfur, hydrogen, and oxygen. And that's how they're associated to the red, blue, and green color channels. So hydrogen is going to be, of course, uh, green. Sulfur will be red and oxygen will be blue. But when I do a hydrogen, oxygen, oxygen, it'll be hydrogen associated to red, oxygen associated to blue and green and it'll make some amazing colorful images. So the Western Veil Nebula is a supernova remnant. So what exactly is a supernova, right? When a star gets big enough, it collapses in on itself and it explodes in one of the most violent things that exists in the entire universe. Scientists and professional astronomers can actually see supernova in other galaxies because they're so bright they stand out where anybody that just so happens to be imaging that particular night could actually see a difference between the night before and that night where they actually see the supernova so i also said i'm going to be using my red blue and green filters and what that's going to do is it's going to allow me to get natural star colors i'll take three or five minute long exposures with these red, blue, and green channels. And it's going to allow me to actually get natural looking stars in my image. So what you can do is there's multiple processes to do this. I can actually take a broadband image and stitch it together with a monochrome image to have natural looking stars, but use the narrowband filters to truly capture the narrowband colors with hydrogen and oxygen in particular. There is sulfur in there, but hydrogen and oxygen are gonna be the dominant two elements that I as an amateur astrophotographer can actually capture. So again, tonight we're gonna to be using this same rig and this is where I defer just a little bit with someone like Trevor with Astro Backyard is Trevor spends a lot of time reconfiguring his telescopes for different shoots for different targets and i used to do that i did it a lot i've used everything from a richie Krejcian all the way to a schmidt cassegrain to a refractor to a newtonian i've used a lot of different telescopes 
And at the end of the day, with a nine month old baby now, it's a little hard for me to consistently be making these changes. Plus the software, ask anybody that is in this particular hobby and they will tell you, this rig can run one night and the next night I might have a ton of problems between guiding or just something going wrong that I take a long time to get corrected before I can finally get up an imaging. Not every night is a guarantee that it's going to go smoothly. I know plenty of people even here in Kansas City as well as outside of Kansas City that one night it runs perfectly, the very next night they have nothing but problems. Anybody that tells you they do this hobby and they never have issues, they're lying flat out. There's no way around it. Even with this setup that I have tested for months now, I can still have issues. It thankfully doesn't happen that often and my biggest issue is just getting the mount to connect. But at the end of the day, it's still an issue that shouldn't happen. You know, currently when I do this hobby, the biggest thing that I seem to struggle with is time. You know, making sure that I've got enough time for, for work with my day job and then with a child and then the wife and doing things. We just always have to make sure that we're doing things first and then this comes second. So, you know, if there's gaps or anything in the videos, just be patient with me. With a nine month old baby, we are trying to make things happen here at the house and then astrophotography is definitely a number two or so I'm told it is a number two. <laughs> When I'm not out astro imaging, I usually play a lot in the pen with the baby. The only reason why you don't see him right now is he's currently asleep. He goes to sleep usually by 7 o'clock, and he's usually up right about 6 a.m. So our day starts pretty bright and early, sometimes even as early as 5. This is usually where I like to lay because I can actually fall asleep in here. My wife actually gives me grief about that, that I could fall asleep here while watching the baby. But if he's fully enclosed, why not? So we're going to image the Veiled Nebula. And again, it, it's absolutely spectacular. I can't wait for you to see it. Um, some of the key things to remember with that nebula, the fact that we can get it with both narrowband and broadband filters is exciting because it's not going to be just a target that is only gonna be benefited with monochrome. Anybody with a one-shot color can also get some spectacular details out of this with no filters included even. Obviously, narrowband is going to be the recommendation because longer exposures gives you a little bit more light. But also, you're going to better isolate light pollution. It is also in the constellation of Cygnus, which if you remember, that's where our last couple of targets have been with the Crescent and Soap Bubble Nebulas, as well as our last video that showed the Tulip Nebula, as well as the exciting black hole bubble or jet. Estimates suggest that based off of the age and the shock wave that we're actually gonna be able to image, of how much it's expanded when they put it together, they estimate that the star that exploded was somewhere around 20 times more massive than our own sun. So with all of that, let's go ahead and get this imaging taken care of. We're gonna get it processed and let's see what we got.